Hello and welcome. It's Wednesday. It's time for Capital Connection, where we try to give you the dots that will enable you to see the big picture for business. I'm Godfrey Mutizwa. On the agenda today, in recent years in South Africa and Zimbabwe, uh, we have seen news dominating land reform conversations on the African continent. Zimbabwe's land invasions illustrated how political opportunism can take advantage of the thirst for land and result in economic catastrophe. And likewise, here in South Africa, the land question has become part of the politics of destruction, increasingly used to disguise the mismanagement of the country's economy. But the dynamics of land differ from country to country. We will get views from experts in various African countries on their country's land issues. But first, the Democratic Republic of the Congo heads to the polls on the 23rd of December 2018. The challenges for the holding of the vote are immense and no more so than in North Kivu province. Apart from the province sharing the country's poor infrastructure and communications, it is also dealing with an Ebola outbreak in an armed insurrection centered on the city of Fabeni. Joining me now is Andre Kabunda, the DRC's country director for the Electoral Institute for Sustainable uh, democracy in Africa. Andre, thanks very much indeed. With that background, where we're talking about an Ebola outbreak and we're also talking about violence that is taking place on the ground, the only cause surely is to suspend the election. Yes, one should you should think like that, but uh, this morning the Electoral Commission just uh, gave the go-ahead of the ele uh, election campaign and uh, I think that, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, the election should be postponed because there are too many problems, logistical and also, uh, especially in that part of the country yeah. where there are army, uh, you know, uh, I think two or three days ago, uh, some um, uh, 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 Monisco lost, I think, seven soldiers. Yes. So uh, it's going to be very a uh, quiet challenge, but uh, at the end of the day is uh, the Electoral Commission we will be deciding. It sounds to me like you're saying even right at the outset this election is going to be compromised and whatever result comes out of there might likely not be credible. Yes, uh, at the, the, to, to, to a certain extent, because, you know, uh, uh, DRC is a big country, uh, it's like a subcontinent, and uh, also the election is taking place during the, the, the raining season. So uh, that's also another challenge, because uh, as you know, um, DRC uh, doesn't uh, agree um, to deal with uh, UN for yes. the, the deployment. I mean, uh, uh, there are the no international observers that are ex being allowed in. Exactly. But uh, uh, I think that the, the, the most uh, challenge is the logistical one, because we can remember during uh, the voter registration, yeah. and uh, I think that uh, uh, the Electoral Commission took four, four months to deploy e equipment, sure. but now uh, how can we expect the same uh, uh, Electoral Commission to deploy in less than one month? Uh, the, 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 the the elect uh, I mean those voting machine yeah. so it's quite a challenge but uh, at the end of the day is the electoral commission we will be deciding if they want to continue to pursue to pursue with the election or yeah. uh, to postpone it how big an area are we talking about here and what's likely to be the impact on the overall election outcome Oh, so the, the, the impact will be, I mean, it, it will be huge because, uh, you know, we, uh, I just uh, spoke with some colleagues and friends from yeah. GRC yeah. and uh, uh, they ju told me that uh, by uh, the way that uh, the Electoral Commission, the CENI is deploying its material, yeah. it, we will be covering uh, around 70% of uh, the DRC. So sure. sometimes 30% uh, will be yeah. Will yeah. not vote. But what percent? Oh, sorry, how, what percent? 30%. About 30% likely may not be able to vote. Exactly. What about in uh, the area that we're talking about, North Kivu? Uh, 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 you know, where, 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 where the, the violence is and where there's the where Ebola. The Ebola. So uh, people are displaced. So I don't know how the Senate will uh, try to cover that. We don't know the size of the population of the area? Yeah. Oh, I've got the figures, but sure. on my computer, I don't Oh, I see, okay, you don't have the figures right here on you, yeah. yeah. I wonder also to know if there's been any campaigning at all that's been taking place there. 
the, normally the campaign start begin this morning. So it, oh, I see, okay. it exactly it's gonna take place for thirty days. Yeah. But uh, in, let's say in Kinshasa, people already you know those candidates already start their campaign. Yeah. Uh, because uh, they don't respect uh, what the electoral commission, uh, yeah. the law of the 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 the, the, the electoral commission. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so the, the, I can say that the campaign already started. Yeah, and uh, informally, of course, exactly. yes, yeah. yeah. But uh, before you go, Andrew, just give us uh, a, a picture, if you like, of uh, the conditions on the ground ahead of this election. How ready is the country? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see you are sighing, yeah. and, you know, yeah. almost like defeated. Yeah, but the, the country, you know, the country is ready uh, from what they are saying. But what we are seeing, uh, we think that the country is not quite ready uh -huh. uh, to, to, to organize that uh, election. But be, as I was saying before, the country is too big and uh, there are too many challenges. And uh, even um, to just to deploy the, 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 the electoral uh, um, uh, material, it's going to be yeah. a nightmare. I don't want to be defeatist, but I wanted to ask you if you think any outcome that will come as a result of the current conditions that we're seeing on the ground will produce a credible election. Um, I, I really, I don't, I, I don't think so because there are too many uh, issues yeah. that the opposition is fighting. The first one is uh, to 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 go to the election without the voting machine, and the second one is, uh, uh, you know, uh, when uh, the um, the electoral commission uh, did that uh, voter uh, roll, and uh, the opposition are trying to 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 convince. I mean, I mean uh, there are six million of um, voters with, without fingerprinter, and uh, for the opposition, they are saying that uh, the, the electoral commission must remove those six million. Sure. Yes. So um, till now, you know, the 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 the, the opposition is fighting yeah. uh, for 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 those uh, two uh, issues. So I don't know, but uh, uh, if the 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 the, the EMB, the Senate, will agree, but for the Senate, we must go for the election. Absolutely. So we've got a problem with uh, the, 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 the the process of, uh, of of organizing the election itself. Yes. There's the violence that we're talking about. We're exactly. also talking about the rainy season coming in. Exactly. Absolutely. So it's going to be, uh, let, let wait and see eh, <laughs> what will happen. Absolutely. Uh, thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us uh, today. Thank you. Now, there are a few more troubling colonial legacies than the issue of uh, land ownership. Earlier, my colleague Arnold Segawa spoke with Professor Ben Cousins, the University of the Western Cape's chair in poverty, land and agrarian studies, and widely regarded as one of South Africa's doyens on the land issue. Strip away the political posturing, and there is, it appears, a relatively easy fix to South Africa's land question. Many thanks for making time to speak to us, Ben. Just uh, give us a sense of how important it is to uh, solve this land issue for the stability of South Africa. Uh, it's very important in my view. Uh, it, the land issue is a very key issue in South Africa. We uh, have a, an ambitious land reform program. Uh, setting out to redress the injustices of the past. It's been a key part of post-apartheid policy, and unfortunately the land reform policy has failed dismally to date. Very little land has been transferred. Where it has been transferred, it hasn't been used uh, productively, and as a result there's been very weak impacts on poverty and inequality. Right, uh, Ben, usually when uh, we do see some economic downturns vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis depressions, now a recession, that's when the land question comes to the front. Do you get the sense that over the past 24 years the NC has made some progress, or if it hasn't, just give us a sense of uh, some scenarios here that you can point out? I don't think there's been very good progress at all. It's been slow. Few people have benefited. Restitution, uh, returning land to people from whom it was taken has not succeeded. Uh, tenure rights, land tenure rights is still weak. So the ANC's program has failed dismally. In a context of high levels of unemployment, massive levels of poverty, deep inequality, uh, this land then becomes a symbol of so many other things which are wrong in our society, so many other problems which have not been addressed. And particularly for young people who are unemployed, and are not set to get jobs in the economy in the near future. Land comes to symbolize a different path, a different way of doing things. And this, that's, this is why it's assumed its high political profile in the last year or so. 
uh, around this issue of expropriation and compensation. I think it's a sign that things are not well in post-apartheid South Africa. Ben, uh, let's talk about the Constitution. Uh, of course, rule of law coming to play here, uh, a democratic state. Uh, is there a, a provision in the Constitution that does allow for uh, expropriation, or is there a need to actually amend the Constitution as it is going forward? Section 25 of the Constitution, the so-called property clause, expressly allows expropriation of land. Uh, and it says it does so for, uh, for public purposes and also uh, in the public interest. The public interest is defined as including land reform to redress the injustices of the past. What the Constitution says about expropriation is that it must be just and equitable levels of compensation, taking into account a range of factors uh, of which market value is only one factor. The history of the land, how it was acquired, the degree to which the apartheid state subsidized landowners in the past, these must also be taken into account in deciding on levels of compensation which are just and equitable. Now, in the view of many commentators and many legal academics, this does actually allow for expropriations which in some instance will not involve compensation being paid at all. In other words, zero levels of compensation. For example, where land has long been occupied, uh, by people living in an informal settlement. It has no market value. The owner has, in fact, abandoned that land. It can be acquired at zero compensation. So, in fact, the legal consensus is that the Constitution already allows for expropriation uh, at compensation well below market value, and in some cases, at zero compensation. So the argument is that we don't need to amend the Constitution. It already provides for this possibility. Unfortunately, Parliament has decided that the Constitution must be amended. Uh, and that is where we, we sit at the moment. And I think that deserves some, uh, some analysis of where we likely to go from here. Ben, an operative word there in, in your last statement is uh, equitable. Now, the, the Treasury is definitely not having its uh, uh, finer years, uh, if we're to be uh, candid about that. Do you really uh, feel that this should be a pressing matter, given the fact that there's, there's a recession in play here, uh, it's really tough times, uh, our commodities are struggling. Uh, do the coffers actually have uh, this money lying around to settle uh, 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 people to be compensated? Look, even if we were to pay market values for land acquired, for, for land reform. It would actually be affordable by our Treasury. Uh, the fact of the matter is that land reform has very rarely had more than half a percent of the national budget. If we were to double that to 1% or take it to 1.5 or 2% of the budget, which I think would be justified given the, uh, the political stakes at the moment, then the country could definitely afford to purchase that land at market value, never mind at below market value and transfer it to the beneficiaries of land reform. Of course, it would mean giving it a slightly higher priority than it does at the moment. It would mean taking a little bit of money from somewhere else. But given the massive waste in government, I think it definitely is affordable. I don't think uh, the wider economic situation is such that we cannot proceed with a politically necessary land reform at this key moment in our history. So South Africa's annual defense spending budget averages nearly three times more than that allocated to land reform. Ask yourself, where is the threat to South Africa's stability? Maybe our spending priorities are misguided. After the break, we get the views on land reform from across the African continent. Welcome back. Now, every country in Africa, and that does include Liberia and Ethiopia, suffered under some form of colonial rule. The winds of change might have started blowing through the continent more than half a century ago, but the land issue remains largely untouched and represents a clear and present danger for stability in many African countries. Tasa Misubia went along to a conference themed expropriation without compensation, uh, hosted by the libertarian-leaning Free Market Foundation. The focus was Africa's land reform, and she filed this report. 
I'm at a conference today hosted by Free Market Foundation. The focus of today's conference is about finding the balance between equitable distribution of land and economic growth. We spoke to delegates from around the African continent about how to achieve this balance. In Ghana, we say that people, people, uh, I mean, people hold lands on behalf of the dead, the living, and the generation yet to be born. So that's how sentimental we are, sent, sentimental the issue of land can get. But it, it shouldn't get in the way of decent economic decisions. You know, uh, Ghana land reform can be a basis for empowering because if a nation is an agrarian nation, uh, the, the, the citizens are given an opportunity to, to produce uh, but under uh, supervision. In other words, land reform, proper land reform can empower a nation. But ex it is when it becomes expropriation that is where the problem is because it doesn't come with title ownership. Not many people having access to title deeds or having access to documents that prove that they have ownership of their property. Just about 3% of the entire land in Nigeria is registered with the government. And that's, uh, that's, that's a huge loss for many Nigerians who cannot use um, the, who cannot actually um, take loans from banks or um, butter their legally owned um, land because they do not have documents to prove that they own it. We have uh, a small research made by our organization to show, to show that it uh, is not uh, possible to reduce poverty in Burundi without the right, without proper right from the land who people, who uh, two or three generation Burundian people have this land before uh, the government come. After independence, we see a government that adopted the colonial rule, the statutes that um, were complex and many administering of our land, a centralization of land into the uh, ownership of land to the state, which al enabled the state officers to um, irregularly allocate land to their networks, corruption, land grabbing. So that and uh, population increase, urbanization also, and the pressures on cities led to serious cat catastrophes and on the economy regarding land. The threat to bad land reform would mean that you would have business diffidence in the economy, which means people would not invest in the economy. And as South Africa has shown, you are likely to lose a lot of investors. I mean, in, to think that in 2015, when Ghana was undergoing strenuous economic reforms, I had business interests from South Africa trying to relocate to Ghana. So that tells you something, even at that time. So if you guys make a mistake of going ahead of the EWC in the manner in which it is proposed, a lot more capital will fly away from South Africa. If in the country don't have the best uh, uh, police public about uh, uh, proper rights is very difficult to get to have investment in our country. It's very difficult to have uh, more people can, uh, entrepreneurs who can create a job in our country. It's very difficult to, 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 to have an investment who understand in the country have security. Because if you haven't proper rights, it means in the country you haven't security. Uh, com commission de terre et autres biens. It means is a commission who charge about land, a history, to study story, to delimit the land in Burundi. But uh, uh, when the commission starts their work, in the middle of uh, in the work, the commission start to say this land is not for these people, this part of people or this generation because this land is for government. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult to, to, to get land. The moment you um, enact the EWC, it means that government has almost absolute power over all property in the country. And um, politicians will most likely start using that um, power, politicians in power, to grab land of, op of opposition, uh, it, it's, it's, the policy proposal can be used in very, neg very many negative ways. Apart from that, um, you, do not, um, you do not address this injustice, the injustice that had happened years ago with another injustice. Zimbabwe used to be the food basket of the continent, but one law has changed the 
you know, fate of the country that has been on its knees for years on as they struggle to, be, as they struggle to bring change. So I, I don't think there was any better example for any African to see how important and how uh, key land reform is with Zimbabwe as a case study. Well, uh, look, uh, Zimbabwe was playing a very big role in terms of uh, exporting food in, in the SADC. Uh, so because uh, the land reform process uh, uh, became very toxic uh, and, and, very, and very hateful, so it meant that uh, you know, the, the, the development uh, uh, you know, trajectory was interfered with. Uh, uh, we, we became, in Zimbabwe became a pariah state of property rights violations. So it, it really meant that even attracting foreign direct investment, because remember during the land reform, uh, bilateral agreements were violated, uh, especially for transnational companies that, that owned land uh, and, and farms and, and property uh, who had a large scale export you know, uh, you know, arrangements with EU. So it, it displaced the, uh, you know, the, the, the optimum uh, economic uh, balance. But uh, the ruling party under uh, Mugabe made it agent in 2000. Why? Because uh, Mugabe's political you know, tenure uh, was under threat. So he created a new uh, paradigm around land hunger so that he, he uses uh, the law to parcel land uh, to, to his cronies and to his supporters in, in, uh, under the auspices of empowerment. So I really feel that uh, you know, the agency of, of land reform had already been taken uh, you know, uh, off uh, the agenda in the first 10 or 15 years of, of independence. What came afterwards was a, a political uh, uh, you know, revenge. I mean, Zimbabwe should be picking up lessons from us. I recall that the Zimbabwean uh, minister for lands about seven years ago was in Ghana and was extolling the virtues of the land reform. And I asked him a simple question. How many acres of land do you own? He said he has 600. And I asked, how many acres does everybody else own? He said, well, he thinks everybody else gets accordingly. And I said, but that's not the way to do land reform. You cannot expropriate lands uh, under the, and which were held by well, previous usurpers, if you like, uh, and then tend to do far worse. Currently, what we have right now, um, the government owns all land in, in the country. Um, the state governors and um, the local government chairman, which in South Africa would be like your city mayor, basically have the rights to authorize transactions um, with, um, with regards to uh, changing in ownership of land. And every Nigerian who um, who has a property basically has, is actually a, a tenant of the state because you have access to that property for 99 years and um, after 99 years the government re evaluates whether to extend that um, tenorship or not. Uh, so the proposals that, I see that seem to be gaining the ground more is to go back to the um, free old system that we have. Um, I think South Africans who are interested in, who are debating the subject of the EWC have Zimbabwe to look to. You know, Zimbabwe is a neighbor that has experimented with um, a similar proposal in the past with disastrous consequences. So it's very important that South Africans be very careful about um, how, you, how you approach the UWC. It's a very dangerous policy proposal that um, I believe South Africans should, you know, should um, rightly consider. I think that most of the conversations that I've, that I've had many people give um, is very emotional, and I understand where that is coming from. However, the EWC, as it's presently constituted, does not seem like the solution to South Africa's issues right now. Um, basically having, uh, you know, trying to address that in the injustice that happened before with um, the government taking absolute ownership of all land is, um, is very risky. Um, I, would, I would say that um, there are other policy lines or other policy proposals, other ways to address this issue than um, than total control of land by the government. Oh. You know, land reform uh, as an ideology is not dangerous. Uh, but if it is expropriation, if it is invasion, and if it is done arbitrary, it has a, a multifaceted, multifaceted complication. First of all, uh, you become uh, branded as a, a perennial violators of, of, of human and property rights. And secondly, you take out land 
uh, from the from the market system, uh, and it 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 uh, results in deforestation and, and so forth. And thirdly, uh, you know, it becomes politicized. In other words, land uh, becomes a tool uh, to to promote uh, political hegemony, and then it takes out the, the the aspect of empowerment. The way culture will play out in the modern day, while we have to be very careful in how we fuse this to maintaining our culture and also ensuring that we keep up with, you know, changes in society, population increase, multiculturalism. So land reform is very important and it can make or break a society. And that's where we leave it for Capital Connection today. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Join us again on Capital Connection every Monday and Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Central African time. Good night.